Well, the first week of the 2024 PGA Tour season officially in the books. We've got a lot to cover there uh, in terms of what happened on the course. And, uh, of course, today we have some anticipated, long-anticipated breaking news off the course. Tiger Woods officially ending his partnership with Nike. We're going to cover all that in today's show. Uh, But let's just begin with a a warm welcome to you, Smiley, who who are still enjoying uh, the Hawaiian Islands over Kapalua. Got a chance to play the plantation course yesterday and and then you know at some point heading over to uh to the sony open to cover that this following week so uh how how was how was week one uh in in hawaii good good vibes and enjoying your time over there yeah man great vibes uh my my (laughs) legs my feet are all tired from walking up and down the hills Mm. at kapalua so i'm i'm very excited to get to honolulu for the flattest week of the year uh at the sony so it's just kind of wild being in the same state and have a place that could be a golf course that's so hilly. And then you go to another part that is just, uh, that couldn't be full more flat, the golf course that we play. So two completely different vibes, but still, um, I think I have to make a bunch of birdies over there too this week. Cause it is absolutely pouring rain. So that place is going to play very soft this week. Well, it's a good place to start. Uh, obviously we're going to get to Chris Kirk's win, kind of detail some of the, the names in the field that are worth covering, uh, given the weeks that they had, um, but the course was sort of a, a hot button issue of sorts, uh, both online and as part of the broadcast this week, you tweeted early on in the week, uh, just calling this the most unique course on the PGA tour. Um, obviously not a difficult course. And I think that was the point of contention for many, but, you know, having to hit so many different shots, uh, due to uneven lies, ele- elevation changes, the creativity required there, you compared it to. Uh, an Augusta National uh, type of uh, maybe maybe not necessarily challenge, but just uh, in terms of the topography and the shots you're hitting there. Um, so that that's maybe the good. Uh, the you can decide whether or not it's bad was was just how easy the course played, as you noted. So the final round scoring average of sixty six point six six, which is uh, six a little more than six under par, is the lowest single round average on the PGA Tour since at least nineteen eighty three. Easily beat. Uh, the old mark of, of uh, five and uh, three quarter shots under par at the 2003 Bob Hope Indian Wells Country Club. Uh, some other things of note in relation to the course and the way it was played. Sung J M, who finished T five in this tournament, finished the week with 34 birdies, which is a new record in a 72 hole PGA Tour event. He made 11 birdies uh, when he shot a 10 under uh, final round 63, and of course, uh, friend of the pod Max Homa. Uh, had uh, the longest recorded drive in the shot link era since 2003 with a 477 yard drive on the par four seventh hole. So before we get to your thoughts on, on this course and, 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 you know, is it, is it worth having a, a fun, very score, scorable course on tour every year, or is that something we want to get away from to make everything challenging? I think it's also worth kind of setting the table for the plantation course specifically, because It was last year the easiest on tour in relation to par. Uh, It's the only par 73 course on tour. Um, But, you know, a lot of people say, hey, look, you know, one of those par fives, the the fifth hole, uh, that was the easiest hole on tour last year. And you could just convert that into a par four. And maybe that would make it a little more difficult and make it a par 72. Well, if you did that, Kapalu would still be easier than every other course on tour, except for PJ West Nicholas course. So, you know, I don't know if you have other ideas or ways to make this a, a, a stiffer test for these guys, or if you even want to do that, because this week is meant to be easing into the season, seeing the best play an easy course relatively well and go low. Where do you shake out on, on, you know, all the things you enjoy about this course versus all the critique it gets for the way it's played? Yeah, I think, you know, yesterday, uh, kids and I and Kurt Byron went out and played the golf course, kind of like you said a minute ago. And, you know, our job as announcers is to kind of relay what the challenges are that the players face and on, on every shot. And we, we kind of like to set up, you know, what are they, uh, what are they fearful of? Well, you know, what, what are they looking out for? But after playing it again, cause I, I played it back in, um, 16 during the tournament, but you know, I, I even being out there all week, you, you still like, you know, it's easy, but until you really play it and see your golf ball on it it gives you that perspective of like, holy crap. Okay. It's just, it, it's just not hard at all. It, 
the only the only thing i thought was hard out there was chipping like into the grain stuff like really nasty like we were trying to chip short of 14 and we were all just laying the sod on it but other than that like everything was so so easy um and yeah like i you i that tweet bringing up augusta national like i did say like you know the golf course is like the challenge is not there compared to augusta national by any Mm -hmm. means but there are similar types of shots you have to hit now they are easier because it's first off there the trouble is not there you have to be so uh, precise on where you leave the golf ball capilouli you do to an extent there's just plenty of room the misses you know you really don't get ever get in too much trouble unless you just have some some very uh outlier misses i would i would call them because most misses end up in okay places and um uh, you know the golf course yeah you could make the par five fifth hole, which I think is one of the easiest holes on the PGA tour, a par four. I mean, it's still, you'd be hitting driver six iron into a pretty big green. You're not necessarily making birdie. If it was a par four, uh, it would be a lot of pars, but you know, there's not a whole lot you can do to the golf course because it, you just really have to have a two to three club wind to make it challenging because it's, there's just too many drivers and wedges. It's just too short. Um, the downhill holes, although they can play up to 575 yards on some of them, you know, I, I hit like three wood nine iron into 17 yesterday and it's like 580 or something like that. So, and in some, some years, you know, in years past here, you know, if they've got a bunch of rain and the place is playing softer, you know, you're hitting, like, if you add a bunch of wind and a, a softer golf course, it's a much more difficult uh, track because you're hitting at times four to five clubs more into greens. It's it's, it can be that drastic out here because of how much roll you get on some of these holes. So you throw in a softer golf course and wind and and you have a little bit different challenge on your hands. Um, This week we had light and variable winds. It was firm. I was talking to uh, Sahith Thigala walking down the 17th yesterday and he was looked at me. He's like, "Dude, the ball will not stop rolling." <laughs> <laughs> like his drive on eighteen went four hundred sixty yards, is what I had it at. And the hole before he, it's like this little cutty driver trying to keep it short of three ninety nine through the fairway. And this thing would have kept. I mean, if there wasn't rough at the end of the fairway, his ball's mm-hmm. in the hazard all day. I mean, it just was a rocket ship in the fairway. So, um. Yeah, I you know I I imagine that while you're watching the tournament, I, I assume that there's probably annoyance seeing the leaderboards of how many people were in this golf tournament. But you know what? I think it's a fun event. It used to be more fun when there was only thirty guys. I thought the fifty nine guys here this week was different. I hated the mm. threesomes vibe. Um, I, I would like it to be back. Go go back to you know what is this tournament winners? It, it, yeah, it just kind of lost its identity a little bit, but. I will say in this day and age of the PGA tour, I don't think it's a bad thing that we have 59 guys there because Mm -hmm. just from a depth piece, I think, you know, we used to have the best players in the world here and it was, you know, the 30 dudes here were all superstars for the most part outside of 10 dudes. Now you got 59 guys here where, you know, it's, it's not all superstars here, but there's a lot of really, really high quality players in the middle and the back half of the field which I don't know if that helps you from an official world golf ranking standpoint, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's going to be a similar field. We're going to see eight times this year. So hope you, hope you like the guys that we're playing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I, a couple things there that I think are worth just emphasizing. One is you were not the only person making the Augusta national comp. Um, You know, that that's not a crazy one. I know people see the scores and say like this in Augusta, no way. I mean, this is something that Jeff Shackelford sh- said in his quadrilateral newsletter that dropped today. And and by the way, this is a place where, where he, he and others have used as a predictor of success at Augusta National in the past. I mean, you know, who won uh, Kapalua last year? John Rahm. Who won the Masters last year? John Rahm. You know, I mean, this, it's not crazy to look at this and say maybe, you know, Chris Kirk and others who played well here, Jordan Spieth, you know, yeah, Sahit Tagala could, could play well at Augusta as well because of the type of, you know, creativity that it requires. So. I think that one you know, definitely makes a lot of sense, even if Augusta is, of course, uh, a tougher test. Um, I'm curious. You mentioned this a little bit. You know, you 
going out and playing it and, and the difficulty of this course lying and maybe some of those grainy chips. Um, and I've kind of heard it said that Kapalua used to be a much tougher course when they had early iterations of Bermuda on the greens that were, were much, much grainier and, and difficult to read. And it, it, in its current day form, as it stands, it is very difficult to read. That was something that, that you and kids and others alluded to on the broadcast of guys who show up for the first time. I saw this a couple times with Ludwig Gobert on the broadcast this week where he, he, put, he hits a putt and he's looking at it like, it does that how, you know, and it, you know, certain putts that break up the mountain or towards the ocean and, you know, cups that are cut kind of on the edge of, of two different, you know, grain, grain going in different directions, which makes it kind of tricky to read putts or, or know where it's going to end up. And I wonder just that if you think part of the reason why this course has become much easier to play are advances in agronomy where there, there is, you know, strains of Bermuda, or other grasses that are much less grainy and, and, and much easier to kind of read and, and, and much more predictable. And if, you know, is there a world in which it's worth a, a, a golf course staying with a, an old world grass or, or a less advanced grass to, to keep the challenge of that course up for tour, tour pros or others? Yeah, nothing to really say there because I went out there and I, I couldn't miss a putt, Charlie. Could not miss a putt. So, <laughs> Um, must be nice Mark. yeah i think these tour <laughs> players got a real problem with their games because i didn't have an issue you know i made everything mm -hmm. i looked at <laughs> now the mm -hmm. chipping on the other nice. hand <laughs> uh i was uh i was kind of struggling a little bit around the greens chipping um especially out of the tight stuff and into the grain i was actually trying the uh the strategy of moving forward while I chipped just to try to get the low mm. point way forward like victor does um and that that came with a little bit of success, but boy was I diggy! Oh my goodness! <laughs> so I, I honestly think the only way to play those shots when it's that grainy is a like a pitching wedge or nine iron something like that. Because in a tournament, I just would be, ooh, <laughs> my legs would be dancing. Well, the, the man who did not have much difficulty with uh, hardly anything this week, the the winner of this tournament, Chris Kirk, uh, he is. Let's ring our, let's set off our, our sirens, our air horns. The first recipient of the OWGR multi-win bonus, as it were. The the the, the big changes uh, the OWGR made in the offseason are already having an impact. Uh, in tacking on to his win at what was formerly the Honda Classic, what was briefly the Classic in the Palm Beaches, what is now the Cognizant Classic last year. Uh, he got a little four-point bonus on top of the 60 and change he got for winning this event and, and jumps 27 spots and the official world golf rankings from 52nd to 25th. He's, of course, now he punches how much? 27 spots. That seems like kind of high, it, right? I, it does. It does seem very high to me. And, and, I, and I don't, I'm not, I'm no like OWGR uh, scholar or someone who like understands how all this stuff works. In fact, I went to kind of to, to see that and was stunned by that. And then also was looking in the notes and seeing his little four point bonus. Like, there we go. That's, we're, we're going to see that. Uh, a fair amount this next year of like that calendar year bonus for winning multiple times. Um, this, get, this like gets, that? do you like that? Um, I, I think like almost everything in the golf world in today's day and age, like I would just want to see how it plays out before I make a, you know, a solid decision either way. Like I, I think winning is hard to do uh, no matter what tournament you're playing in. So maybe this is one way for guys who are, you know, uh, like if, if I guess if we're looking at, you know, the, the signature events and how much more points they're getting versus, you know, whatever you want to call regular PGA tour events or opposite field events. And so in a FedEx cup, since those guys aren't uh, you know, getting as much weight there for their wins, if the if other ways to play yourself into those events or other majors are through the OWGR, a guy who's winning a bunch and those sort of events, if he's getting little bumps here and there for those wins, maybe that's one way to kind of, you know, help out the, whatever you want to call it, the mule, the non-signature event player, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of want to see it play out more before I issue a verdict on it either way. Um, Kirk, so Kirk is, he was finished 31st in the FedEx cup last year. He's in all the signature events uh, and not a guy that I would necessarily classify as a mule because I think that's maybe both a disservice to his game and also like his current tour status. He's in all these events. It's not really in a category where he's struggling for marquee starts. Um, but as we kind of have this discussion and, and, and the way this year is going to play out and everything like that, is this a guy that if you are in that, you know, mule category, 
do you look at his journey over this past year and be like, Hey, that's a roadmap for me. That's how I, that's how I kind of play my way into these, you know, these, these bigger events and, and greater success on tour, you know, effectively play better. And that's how I get there. Yeah, absolutely. Play better. And man, I'm just sitting here looking at this official world golf ranking and it's just, man, for a niche sport, which <laughs> was what I keep reading on Twitter, which I'm like, what? I mean, this is this is my livelihood, man. Like, this is no niche sport. This is the sport. So, but but Charlie, when I look at this, man, it's just like, how do we take this seriously? This world golf rankings list, <laughs> it's just not even. Oh god, it's just not a. Well, not what a what what list. about it? What about it strikes you as being odd in your opinion? Just, I mean, dude. I mean, if Live Golf wasn't here, obviously it would, it would. I wouldn't have an issue with it. It's just, it's yeah. hard to properly rank with the Live Golf Tour guys not being there because you know there's top fifty in the world players over there that are, you know, I, I just see other guys in the top fifty that I'm just like, what? <laughs> in what world is this guy better or ranked higher than a Dustin Johnson? You know, or a, the list kind of goes on as Live guys, Bryson DeChambeau. It's just, it's just. You can't even compare. I mean, it's just not a list I can take seriously anymore. I, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I think all of these things, unfortunately, are discussions that are attached to other discussions. It's like we can sit here and, you know, talk about a move that a guy's made on a week to week basis that gets him in more events, you know, whether it's PGA Tour events, you know, that are, that are, you know, you're getting top 30. You know, this is, I mean, again, Chris Kirk already in all these events via his. FedEx Cup finished last year, but if he wasn't, this would have gotten inside that top 30 cut line, which is like the method of entry that Justin Thomas will use to, to play in these signature events going forward. So you can have these discussions and say, this is how it is, while also looking at that list and saying, this just isn't a real thing or shouldn't be a real yeah, thing. It's just, it's just not, dude. It's it's more of the, you know, top 50 was was the number that judged everything in the game of golf. If you're top 50 in the world, you're in mm -hmm. everything. And now it's just, and it's, it's, and it, I'm not crapping on the dudes that are around 50. It's just, it's just a different name there than what we've mm -hmm. been accustomed to seeing for however many so years. And even if you go from 50 to a hundred, you're just like, man, where, where are these guys that I just, that I grew up watching that were never outside the top hundred in the world. And, and I'm, and I, uh, I'm sure I'll probably offend people when I say all this because they're like they knew the risk they were doing when they went to live. But and I'm and I'm by am no means a live apologist when it comes to this stuff. I just and I know there's other different ranking systems that properly do it, but they're not being adapted. I, I know there's that Tugger, um, I think it's T U G R. Like that's a yeah. that's one that they they're able to base it off head to head matchups and this and that. I don't mm -hmm. know how it works. They came on. Uh, gravy in the sleeves on Sirius XM and Colt and I talked to the guy. Um, it was interesting. I was like, man, well, I'm, yeah. I'm open to anything to properly rank the best players in the world, wherever, whatever that system is I'm in for. I, I'm not saying the top guys don't have like, I mean, it's, it's hard to argue anything in the top 15 is or 20 is that far off. It's more everything from 25 to a hundred. That to me is like where it's yeah, like, okay. Uh, we've kind of got a little lost here uh, because I'm not, I don't watch live golf. Um, I don't have time to <laughs> with, with covering my golf as well. I can see the results check in to see how my cliques are doing. And other than that, you know, it's just, <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised the cliques are, are still around. I mean, shoot at this rate, like John Rahm might end up as a, as a clique. Uh, you know, what a, we'll what a, a moment for him. What an absolute moment that would be for a franchise that I have just nearly, I mean, I, it dear to my heart, you know, uh, to get Rom to come to that franchise would be a, do the cliques still a massive e exist? Move. Is, is that, am, am I, am I putting do myself the out there? Exist. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they do. That's, the that's Kleeks timer squad. Exist. That's timer squad. That's right. What's the squad that, what's the squad that went away? It's, it's just Martin Keimer and Richard Bland right now. So, I mean, there is a yeah. John Rom sized hole on that yeah. roster and I'd be really happy for you. <laughs> If you're able to land uh, the, the free agency whale there. I mean, I think, I mean, to be fair, Martin Keimer technically should have been booted from live for his performance last year. 
uh, and got to retain his status through his captaincy. I think if we're if we're going to be fair and equitable here, and 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 by the way, if we're going to make a case for world ranking points, Martin, we're stripping you of your captaincy. Rom is now wearing the armband for the cliques. You can stay on the roster and play another year, but that's a fair way. Let's make live an equitable. Let, listen, I, I think if, if I see that, I'm saying live. Maybe a little world ranking points coming your way. Yeah, way to go. No, I, I'm all in. Like if if uh, if the cliques are able to get Rom in their roster, wow, what what a what a momentous <laughs> win for a franchise that is needs it. You know, I I think I I said to all my Dallas uh, friends. I was like, who's going to win a championship first? Is it going to be the Dallas Cowboys or is it going to be the Cleeks? And that that's kind of been my bit to those boys Cleeks. for a while. And could be the Cowboys this year, but uh, I don't know about that. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think Rom will look really good in the classic pea green and gold uh, the, the, the Cleeks wear. <laughs> uh, I, I think on the on the world ranking, like if, if I'm – because these days I'm, I'm trying to, despite my New Year's resolution to be a pain in everybody's ass, I'm trying to, you know uh, – be as optimistic as I can for things that are happening in golf spaces. Cause I want all this to end well, because I want to have a better fan experience and have other people come to the game and enjoy the game. So if I'm trying to be an optimist about these world golf rankings changes that we just talked about, you know, in the context of Chris Kurt and others, it's that maybe that's setting the table for ranking live at some point, because if you were to rank live, the, the thing you'd want to control for is, to not give, and I'm sorry that he's catching a stray here. Uh, I'm actually really impressed with what he did last year to earn as much as he did as bad as he played. But, like, we're not giving world ranking points to Siwon Kim in the world for finishing between 45th and 48th no. every week on live. It's just, that's just a, that's unreasonable. It's a 48 player field. So the the the, the changes that, that the OWGR made and saying, and any limited field, no cut event for this next year, the bottom 15% under no circumstance gets points. That's one thing that you feel like maybe opens up the door for ranking live. And the second thing I do think is that maybe they really weight the points you would give to a live style field. So it's like, if you win here, good on you, you beat a lot of good players and here's your bonus. But as it trails down, you're going to get, you know, not as many points as you would. And maybe a, a, a comparable tour field. that's a limited field or whatever, you know, I, I, maybe that's one way to do it where, where it's like you, if you win a bunch on live, Good on you. You're going to get those ranking points. You're going to stay high. If you don't, you're still going to need to play well in majors, and you may slide regardless. So I don't know if any of that feels like that's a fair way to do it, but but maybe that's what the OWGR is signaling through those most recent set of changes. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I, I think the top top players getting world ranking points from that tour makes a lot more sense than the the middle and the back half because that's where a lot of the PGA Tour players have issue is – is the guys that are handpicked that didn't really necessarily earn their way onto mm -hmm. a, a we call it elite tour. We talk it's an elite money tour. So <laughs> to be able to make this much money to be playing for this amount where these players that once stayed on the PGA tour probably should be making that much money when we're looking between the two on uh between the lift off tour and the PGA tour and Man, I, I don't know. It's just uh, it's it's just a interesting time right now because what happens when the Live Golf Tour, if they have John Rahm as their captain player and says, you know mm -hmm. what, we are going to change the format. Like, this is what I came here for. Yeah. We're going to change this format. And whether it's 72 holes, which is going to be like the indicator for the World Golf Ranking, or let's say it's going to be um, not just the 72 holes, but um what, what's the other one i'm trying to think what's the other indicator like the one that they're missing like for world golf rankings well i think they want to make it an open shop and i think that they would say well we just did this live golf promotions thing and we had three players able to join oh, our yeah, tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like pr promotion relegation i think are, are the big ones that they're touting as as making it more of an open shop now again i don't know if booting you know a couple guys at the end uh, of the deal and, and, and then, you know, bringing in three guys really is an indication of making an open shop on a week to week basis. Like, I mean, shoot, I think we've talked about this on this show and I, and I have no idea why, maybe it's just the infrastructure involved. It would make sense. But if you had a Monday qualifier every week for live, it would be so <sighs> exciting. I mean, I, I tuned in every day of that promotions deal. What, what team wants to get the Monday qualifier go? I would, 
as a captain that had a guy that was a random dude every week, I would be so annoyed by that. Okay, well, so here's this is the best idea that I've heard, and, and I'm I feel so bad because someone this was someone else's idea, and I've oh, taken like all it the Monday qualifiers like are on a team. Yes, okay, that's Monday, epic. <laughs> Monday Q team, four guys, <laughs> and if you and then if you win that week, or I'd say it this way: if you finish top three in the team money. It's it's like finishing top ten as a, with a, you know for a guy that money keeps you stay on the Monday team and you stay on the Monday team. The Monday team stays together. You play next week, and if you win the thing, your 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 team's in for the rest of the year. Like you're Amazing. all four guys. Stay. I am all in that, but the team name has to be right. If it's a bad team name, then I'm out on it. You know what I mean? Like if it's right. a if they if they win but they don't have a an epic team name, I'm out on this the whole thing. But if they have the best team name. And let's say they top five. I think you still like. I think that's another opportunity to give them a chance. Like, hey, it's like trivia night, you know, at the local, right, right. local pizza shop. <laughs> it's like, hey, you you won best you name won. of the week. We're gonna get you an exemption <laughs> in the next week because your your name was X, which was hilarious. <laughs> well, and, and this is this is where I'm, I'm gonna feel even worse because this is also this person's idea that I can't remember. But they were saying you call the teams Scrubs GC until they win. And th- and then it's like they get to have a big branding party. It's like, hey, we get we're coming up with our team name for the rest of the Scrubs season. Or- <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm but what, so what into that. But would be what would be more electric than watching you know guy? And they're obviously going to be good players. But it's like these guys could go from nothing, no status anywhere, to winning millions of dollars. And <laughs> and it would. I mean, who wouldn't root for Scrubs GC every week? It would oh be electric. God. It would be yeah. so entertaining. It could be what Liv needs just to get people to care, right? <laughs> and, and great PR, by the way. All, all the people talking about a closed shop, it's for the elites. So here, like, we're going to let you guys in. We're going to let in the, the little guy. I, I To me, it, it's a win in a lot of different places. But anyway, that's my well, unsolicited I was, advice for The <laughs> point I was trying to get to in this before we got off track, and that was my fault because I was trying to remember the, the format and on and off, is if – they do make the changes with John Rom, and that's kind of one of the things that he was hoping would happen to where they would become eligible to receive world golf world official world golf ranking points. Where does that leave the PGA tour? Are they more susceptible now to more players making the jump? Because now there's more money, there is points. So at what point do you look at for a guy that's on the fence and say, you know what, what's what's keeping me here? And we we don't know what's going to happen. I, I think there's still a lot to uh, to to figure out, as we talked about in our last episode. But still, I mean, you have to wonder until that first Live Golf Tour event is played this year. You know, if it's going to be the exact same format, then I don't think you have to worry about a whole lot. But if they start making some changes to the whole concept of of the tour, then I think you're going to have to really question where the PJ tour strength right now. Cause right now with the PJ tour, you would say the one thing they have going for them right now is live golf tour is not getting world ranking points. That is the biggest thing I think they have going for them as a piece against the guys making the jump. It's like, Hey, you go over here. You're taking a big risk about ever playing in another, another major championship again, unless you already are exempt into some of those fields. Agree 100%. And, and here we are. I just told you several minutes ago I was going to try to be optimistic about this. But I think if I'm putting my realist or even pessimist hat on, it's looking at, you know, uh, the various levers that there are to pull, right? And and so to your point there, if Liv gets world ranking points, that's a big one that opens up the door for tour guys to go over there, get a bunch of money, and still get into the to the main things they want to play in those majors. And, and so I think that piece coupled with we don't know what this private equity stuff is going to look like yet. Like, I know we have a, a, a framework in place with with the SSG group. Um, you know, hopefully that leads to to a, a deal getting done with the PIF. But, you know, there's still things that are left to be done there. If we reach a place where, you know, a, a deal does not get done with private equity. Uh, and, and so you're looking more and more reliant on whatever you get done with on the PIF. Pair. Yeah. And they're getting world ranking points. Like I just think guys who as committed as they may have been the PGA tour might just start looking at the exit and saying, that's, you know, maybe the only viable option left for me. So um, we'll see how it all goes. Uh, Here's my awkward segue to a guy who's working hard on this from a policy board perspective. 
Uh, but what we're going to talk about his, his play on the course this weekend, and it's your good buddy uh, Jordan Spieth. Because uh, man, the, the roller coaster was was back in effect to a certain degree. We saw you know some birdie streaks. We saw some hard luck. You know drives ending up in some divots or getting plugged in bunkers. Uh, so some some vintage Jordan stuff this week. But I thought the thing that was was really big uh, in terms of pay attention to because it's been such a huge strength of his at times in the past, and and seems like in in past few years has kind of come and gone is success on the greens. And this week he led the field in strokes game putting. Uh, so just curious, you know, from what you saw with Jordan this week, and, and if we're looking at this year and we're saying, man, if, if he can keep his wrist healthy and if he putts as well as he did this week, and that's going to become a consistent strength for him this year. I mean, this could this be a big year for Jordan? Yeah. And I think when we talked to him, uh, we talked to him around the Memorial last year. Is that about right? That's when, right. Yeah. When he came on the pod. That's right. And he had kind of described his year, um, or at least the first half of the year, being a top five type of year for him. But injuries, like you said, with the hand, uh, you know, multiple injuries last year with that. I, because when I watched him play at, at various times during the year, it felt like to me he was right on the cusp of winning multiple times. You know, he lost in Hilton Head. He had the mm-hmm. uh, offense to win at the Masters again. Uh, just had too many, uh, too many bogeys, too many mistakes. But other other than that, you know, it, it just seemed like to me the tail half of the season just um, inconsistent. But I think it was more due to injuries that he had. He had a back injury at the Wells Fargo. He had hand stuff that was an issue for pretty much the entire second half of the year. So seeing him play well this week without any pain, it didn't look like to me, um, was a good good sign. I know how busy he's been, too, with the policy board stuff. He's been on the phone just like Adam Scott, just like Tiger Woods, Patrick Cantlay. But he's also changing diapers for a two year old and a say. you know, and a four month old. Like that's like one of the most difficult times to be a parent is <laughs> when you have two under two or however old uh Sammy is. And I know Sophie's kinda in that four four or five month range. Just it's a very difficult a time. Uh for him just to manage all the things in his life to be a to be a parent to to be the you know the voice and the the business side for the VGA tour and for it to be representing the players and then also you know he there's not he loves nothing more than to win golf tournaments so to balance all those things it's it's hard to do and I and I'm I know I'm hyping him up a lot but it's it's impressive um because you don't see him out there as a guy that's really concerned about what's going on with the policy board, the PGA tour, because he's so focused on what he's doing. So it's nice to see that he can turn off um, all the stuff that's going on in the game and just basically just say, you know what? <laughs> Y'all call me if you need me because I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm back to playing golf and it, it was good to see him um, hit some big shots down, uh, down the stretch. He just got a bad break on 16. Cause I felt like that Eagle putt on 18, would have been to to make a playoff potentially yeah no nobody understands the plight of the young father more than the podcast uh that you're <laughs> listening to right now uh this is this is an this is like maybe probably an off-air conversation for you but uh found out the hard way this week don't give your one-year-old son flax muffins unless you love changing the most grotesque diapers you've ever <laughs> seen in your entire life uh it's been <laughs> tough scene in the Hume household this week uh, upon uh, learning that, having that realization. But oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was reading a few quotes from Jordan this week and, and I was, there were three things that stuck out to me. Well, I guess really two things. And one was just him talking about the lack of time he's had. And so the assumption I made was first and foremost, yeah, being a, a young dad, having, having another little one at the home, you know, at, 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 uh, at home now. And, and you hear so many young parents talk about like, I think one's hard, just wait till it gets to two. And everything past two is kind of gravy, but like two really ups the degree of difficulty. So definitely I can see why that'd be a big ask. And then, yeah, we, 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 I think we talked about this in our last pod too, of like the, the time ask for that policy board, I think it was Charlie Hoffman that was talking about, you know, the ways in which that demand is twofold where it's not only all the extra meetings you have to, to do and all the time spent on the phone, but then it's when you're going to places where you're hoping to work on your game and improve and tune up, you're running into guys there who want to talk about, you know, who want to catch up with you, who maybe you haven't talked to on the phone already, who want a bit of insight. So, I mean, that's got to be a, a huge, huge ask of Jordan. Um, and, and so, you know, if he has the time now to kind of 
work back into focusing on his game as we approach this new year. I think that'll be a big one for him. Then I think the last piece I saw was just him talking about um, his, his physical therapy efforts. And I just been so on top of that multiple, you know, um, appointments for a week and just the confidence he seems to have in that risk, he, wrist healing process. Uh, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, all things you're saying here too, but just those to me were like, okay, this, this could be a, a good year for him. And, and this is a good start. Yeah, I think so. But speaking you know, of, Oh, go well, ahead. Real yeah. quick, just on the century, uh, as we're kind of like kind of recapping our way out of this, you know, when you look at the field and, you know, was there ever going to be a player outside of like five or six guys that you'd have been genuinely like pumped about winning? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is mm -hmm. like how many players were there there this week where that would have made you really excited about the 2024 season? To me, I felt like the PJ Tour probably wanted a, a very a select few guys to win just to show that. Like they like Scotty winning, Max winning, Jordan winning. Yes. Like to me, those are the guys that they need to win to keep the the momentum train going. Like they didn't, they don't want. Like I love Chris Kirk. Like they don't, they would rather 100%. have somebody like Scotty win because it's easier for them to promote it to to sell to businesses. Like just in a time where the value's gone down, and I think Chris Kirk's one of the like you go watch that guy play. It's unbelievable. Oh but yeah. From as far as just name face brands on the PGA tour. I mean, we have here this week, you know, Xander Shoffley, Colin Morikawa, guys that have won major championships. And you know, that list used to be a pretty long list of major championship winners here at this event. You know, that's, that's was kind of, you got all the stars together besides mainly tiger and Rory never really played, but outside of that, you always had, some of the best fields so it's a weird it was a weird event knowing that you could have somebody kick off the year in a with somebody that wait did they win last year were they did, were they finished in the fedex cup and you're kind of like wondering it's like what is this event now but uh, chris kirk's a very worthy champion just wanted to say that, oh, so. <laughs> well i i think i think that struck me immediately you want chris kirk winning your Honda Classics, or I guess your your Cognizant Classics. That's not you true because he can you, he can win majors, man. Like this 100%. guy's got major champion ability. But I, I'm, you know what I was trying to say there. Uh -huh, right? Well, and, and and that's and that's kind of what you know. And, and again, and, and I was going to tag this on the end, but also worth saying up front. Like I think Chris Kirk is a phenomenal player. I mean, just watching him yesterday, he has that sort of Ernie Els s quality of just that that just smooth, easygoing swing yeah. and his tempo is always good. And, you know, he seems to really kind of doesn't seem to, to falter under pressure. I mean, you saw that in the playoff think about last the, year with Eric. Think Coral. about the President's Cup. President's Cup. And this, and this, and, and he's got a great story. I mean, I think that's the thing is like, he may not be a name brand, but, but not, you know, the story he has and the way that he's willing to own his story and, and, and not, you know, I, I saw other chatter online last night where, where, where people were saying, you know, golly, you know, guy goes through alcoholism and rehab. And every time he does something of note, you know, he, it's the first thing people ask him about it. I think you get tired of, of that. Well, one of the questions to, I guess, to kind of wrap up the press conference last night was on that note. And his response was along the lines of, Hey man, I, it's part of my story. I'm great owning it. And if, and if anything I'm doing is helping other people, that's, that's a wonderful thing. So that's all, you know, I, I, I think it's a great storyline. I love watching him play golf, and I think he's a worthy champion. And, and by the way, I think, you know, th this could set him up for a really big year being in all these signature events and, and finding form again in this, like, kind of second act of his career. All that having been said, and kind of to the point you were making, you'd prefer guys like that to win these non-signature, non-marquee events and, and, and probably not the first event coming out of a year that was right. marked with, you know, how are we re returning value for, you know, these sponsors and, and these, these media partners, you know, if we're not putting the best fields together and, and despite all that we've just said about the quality of Chris Kirk's play and him being a worthy champion, you know, the casual is going to look at this leaderboard and be like, uh, Chris Kirk's leading. Like, yeah, I'm not going to turn this on for the final round. Like I'm good on that. And, and it's a shame. And, and, and it's, you know, so then, and that's where I think where we end up back where we kind of talked at the beginning of the podcast of why this is a niche sport. It's like, People who care about it really care about it. Uh, people who, who at a surface level don't really, they want to be sold marketable superstars. So it's a, it's a difficult one because even in, even in a restructuring of this event 
where it is just the champions, Chris Kirk's still there by virtue of his win last year. So it's not like you're taking a guy like that out of play. It's just, you know, it, 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 I definitely think that there are marketing types or branding types that were looking at this yeah. and being like, and come on, I, Jordan, make a, make a push. You know, <laughs> I think the conversation would have been a little bit more heated up if somebody that, you know, barely got stuck into the top 50 in the FedEx cup that that's probably, we would have probably gotten into this a little sooner uh, with Chris Kirk mm-hmm. winning last year. This it's more of the discussion of, Hey, what happens in the other seven signature events? If we don't have our stars win, that's yeah. going to be the big, the big thing at the end of the year. It's like, okay, how many times did Scotty to Jordan, JT, all the, you know, all the guys that are in the, the high end of the PIP at the end of the year, if they're not winning these events that are going to be for $20 million, you know, you're thinking to yourself, all right, well, why are these guys getting paid $20 million if, if the guys that are winning are not the ones driving the game? So that, that'll be the conversation, but you don't expect it to happen because most of the time the cream does rise, rise to the crop. Uh, <laughs> the cream does rise to the top in events um, where, where the best are gathered. So I don't expect it just something in a monitor of, of, of this, of this new model with a little watered down product that we're used to seeing, you know, what, what are we going to, who are going to be the guys that win at these big well, events? I think there's something interesting in there, which is, you know, that's a win for somebody like in a world in which nobody can be happy all the time and nobody can win all the time and trying to make all these different groups that exist, you know, the platinum tour and the, and the bronze tour and, and right. the players that are going over to the Saudis, you know, that, that in a world where not everybody wins, someone wins. And, and, and if let's say every signature event, you have a guy like a Chris Kirk or someone who's coming out of the next 10 category or the swing five category and winning this thing. Yeah. It's going to stink for, probably the tour and broadcasters and that group, but you know, it's going to be really pumped about that or all these, you know, the, the mule class and, and sort of the, these, these, this group of I hate players that word. I hate the word. Can I, we, can we retire? We need a mule? rebranding. Yeah. Can we I mean, retire that. Cause like, I'm, I just got a little, like a little shot in the arm there. A little, like my, my arm stood up on my, on my, uh, on my, my arm here. Ugh. Yeah, well, well no may, maybe it's maybe it's you know the the uh, you know it's if it's an A and B tour whatever it's just the player that isn't in all these you know top tier signature events that 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 would be something to celebrate for them and give them hope and 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 I think in some ways it, it's a marginal win for a guy like Jay Monahan who is putting together all this research search last year at the Players Championship and saying hey our models are showing that actually only 60% of the guys stay in this thing and you can be part of the 40%. And if a bunch of guys in that 40% go out and get it this year, it's like our models working for somebody, maybe not for the people we wanted to work for, but it's working. They, what they think is going to happen is that these guys are going to beat up on each other. And they, yeah. they think that's where the points are going to get distributed out to where, you know, they're all different guys are going to be catching points each week. It's not going to be, you know, all of these top 25 the same every week. They think it's going to be very jumbled up. They think it's going to be a little bit spread out. And that's where they get the end up getting that 60% number of the 50 guys that are in there right now to be in the top 50 at the end of the year. But I think about the Sony this week and I, and I go and look at PGA tour links and look at the, mm-hmm. uh, the field list for the week. And I see that half the, uh, the guys from the corn Ferry tour are not in uh, the field for the week. And if you've read anything on Twitter this week, you've saw that they had a mandatory rookie orientation at the Sony in which <laughs> all the guys aren't in. So it's, wow. and, and most likely if you, it would be very few amount of players that wouldn't come over here to do the Monday. Um, but the problem is you got to come over here on the weekend on a Saturday, Sunday now to do the orientation. Um, before before the monday so the guys that are in the field have to get here super early to do the orientation and hopefully they're built hopefully these players are building the tour on the travel on this that aren't in because you could have done this at the amex or something like that to where you know they didn't have to travel all the way across a different pond but across the pond over here to hawaii yeah um it just it's interesting. It, like the fact that these, and I guess to get to my point, is like the fact that those players aren't in to me, like where, where are we getting lost in this? Because there's not a, to me, the guys that, that came off this corn Ferry tour should have an avenue to get into these open events. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I think that's where you need to cut down on the top 125. It, it needs to, if it's 25 players that you need to cut down to get it to a, a top 100 to where you can have a, a, a better flow in and a better flow out to where you have expectations of being able to play every single open event if you're a dude coming off the Corn Ferry. Um, it'll make it a much more competitive from for the PGA Tour mm-hmm. standpoint uh, for the guys that are trying to keep their card. And that's where I I would I don't know if it'll ever happen, but if we if we move to that elite type series um, with the Live Golf Tour and where it's mixed in, and then have your your B Tour, whatever you call it, that m- probably should be p- playing for more like I mean they're playing for nine million bucks in these things now. Mm-hmm. Those things should probably be more in the f- four to seven range, right? Like if mm-hmm. you're if you're being honest about the value you're getting with the field, you know, it's probably more in that range and, um, and then continue to pay the top players, the money of which we've been seeing these signature events, $20 million. And, and, and that be kind of how you do it. And it's a bigger B B tour. So a lot more players, full fields in those, and then a, a tighter top tour. And, and that might, it's at a hundred dudes. Is it more like 70? Like, I, I don't know, but I, I probably would lean more towards the 70, 75 players on an elite tour versus 125. That's just too many cards. And that's where we talked about it last week, mm-hmm. but you really see it this week at the Sony. And I, 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 I truly believe that the guys that are coming up should have an avenue to whether it be the B tour, whether it be the, the, an avenue to play in like the swing five, which I think is a cool concept. I think the swing five, is a great way to reward players that are playing well to get into the big events, similar to how we were talking about with the uh, Live Golf Tour and uh, what do you call them the 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 Live Promotions event or the month? Well, I guess our no. Monday qualifier. Oh, what's, Scrubs, what's Scrubs GC, Scrubs, Scrubs, Scrubs GC, GC. <laughs> and you, and you can't do, you can't call them Scrubs right. on the PGA Tour, but because right. uh, they're not going to have a team name. But is that is that kind of that whole bubble? Does it kind of make sense to you when I'm when I'm spitting out? 100 percent, because i think that that there has to be um like i guess the way what you're outlining strikes me is you're creating a a, a pretty compelling b tour like that b tour is going to be really interesting to watch it's going to have some big names and it. it's going to have guys that have won a lot in the past and i guess my head goes to a place where it's like um it, like it goes to like a, a, a international like english soccer football model where you can have really good teams historically that at the end of the year have an off year and they're fighting for promotion relegation at the, at, at the you know, bottom of the table. And, and some of those teams get relegated. And by the way, they go down to a league in the championship underneath the Premier League. That's a really good, fun, compelling league to watch. And a lot of those championships teams still play in cups, which would be equivalent to like a major or another tournament that a player could get in through a different way, even if he's playing on the B tour where you're yeah. still going to see him playing in big things. It's just that on a day-to-day, like week-to-week week basis, like they play on a B tour. And so I, I don't, I don't think it's the end of the world. I, and I, I think it's, I think it should, it, it, it reinforces the thing that you're hearing a lot of these guys say on a week-to-week basis about, you know, Rory said this in the stick to football podcast of like golf should be a meritocracy, you know, and if it is kind of tough luck where some guys past 70 have to play the B tour for a year or some extended yeah, period of time, right, right, right. but get their way back in. Like, I, I think that that that's, and, and by the way, I'd probably watch both tours because it'd, it'd yes. be interesting in both yes. places. So hundred percent. I, I, I love this it. would it's, it's, it's whatever you want to call it. It would be if the PGA tour elite series tour is called, let's just call it the PGA tour. Let's call that the PGA tour. And then the one right below, which would be a bigger field tour the corn fairy plus tour, whatever you want. Like it's, it's a very in between the PGA elite and corn fairy. So that's, you're sandwiching basically what we used to call the corn fairy tour playoffs. Mm -hmm. And that is basically the, the types of players you're going to be get to get in a week to week um, basis on that tour, which is what I would hope um, would happen. Cause then you can play your way into the top 70 for the following year. So the, the guys that I don't know how many you relegate. So let's say you have 50, 70 dudes on that elite series tour. Let's say you keep 45. Now you got 25 cards that you can play for on that corn Ferry tour plus 
and you got 25 cards that you insert, bang, you're in and you're in those events. And then, and then you have the same, it shoot, you can have a, a, a level even bef- below, which, which would be your basic corn fairy tour that plays you into now kind of like there's, there's just an extra step you got to get to, to play for the amount of money that these guys are playing for. I, I think, and I think that's where you get to a more financially responsible place where you have less top tier mouths to feed. So you can feed the top tier mouths more, keep them happy, keep them yes. where they are. While also saying, you don't have hey, to look. do the PIP then, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, you just, you, 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 you become more efficient. You streamline things. And so, and, and it sounds, it sounds, you know, backwards because you're like, I'm creating three more additional classes and I'm trying, but like, I think if you get it right and that's kind of what you're workshopping this year, then, then you don't need to do all the other window dressing going forward. And let's just think about some of the events we're talking about. Like what, let's just, let's just use the John Deere as an example, an -hmm. event that's never really had stars shown up, but is it one of the better events on the PGA tour that gets great support? Yes. It's a great event. And what, like John Deere, they don't want to pay $20 million for Mm -hmm. an event having no clue who's going to show up unless you're guaranteed it to be a signature event. And even now, let's say it used to be that that event used to be when I was on tour, it was one of the lower paying PGA tour events. And I don't know what it was, whether it was four or five million when I was playing, but let's say now it's eight and they don't even know who's showing up. They might not even have a star show up this year. They might have a couple, a couple that can use for marketing, but and, and that's maybe all they really need, but did they really need to pay double what they were paying six or seven years ago for the exact same field that, you know, you have a couple of top 50 players showing up. Um, It's always one of the worst uh, sandwiched events. It's either it's like right before the open championships and nobody's going to the middle of America and then flying over to the other side of the pond. It just never really made sense for guys that were in the top 50. So that to me is like how, and Rory even said, this is like how did, how they got, (laughs) <laughs> how the PJ tour has done well this long without guaranteeing what type of field you're going to have is God, it's amazing. pretty incredible because yeah. you know, the Honda John Deere, like you, you kind of go on three M like you, you think they are excited about not knowing what type of field they're going to get. And you have to back channel to try to, whether it's do a dinner for a player mm-hmm. um, where they come in and, and host uh, for one night on a Wednesday night to get, you know, you pay a, a top player to come into play that, that, were were the things that were having to happen to get these fields to match what they were having to pay from a, a standpoint of like we didn't want to be left to our you know all of our people that we were bringing in for the week and we only had one top 50 player playing and we spent all this money and now double what we used to pay so that to me is is the issue where they're going to run into sponsors and the way you solve it make them pay make them pay right around that three to six million mark which is much more affordable, especially now mm-hmm. in this economy. And you're going to get a field that you probably were always going to get um, w- maybe minus one or two top players, but still you have players that are more on the PJ tour. They're going to be there. I just think that that makes a lot of sense. Full fields there. You got your corn fury below that. Um, this would be your corn fury tour plus or your PJ tour regular. And then you have your elite PJ tour series. Well, and as you're, even as you're talking about the, the the branding of of the different tours of like is this PGA Tour elite and this regular PGA Tour the thing that seems to make more and more sense in my head is is retaining the PGA Tour branding for what becomes the B Tour and making a a big presenting sponsor ask for this elite elevated tour you know whether that's a, a Saudi company or or, or or someone that's that's part of the SSG fold or whatever and it becomes you know this thing where if you want to have one of these, you know, whatever the next iteration of signature event or elevated event is, you got to pony up the big bucks because there's only going to yeah, be hundred percent, 15 of them a year, let's say, or whatever, 20, probably, probably closer to 15, where it's like, if you have this event, we're guaranteeing the best players in the world, including live players at all these events. And so the TV contract, the, the spin has to be bigger for the media companies. The spin has to be bigger for the sponsors. Yep. The purses have to be bigger. And it's truly, truly elite golf. And at that point, I think it's like, okay, I know what I'm signing up for. And that's how we recoup all the money of, you know, to make the whole thing stay afloat is, is these are, these are big ticket deals. And then, and, and, and part of that I think is, 
getting and, live and players. It, you like it if you have ten live players that that cycle in. Let's say the live tour does ex- still exist. You have like a funneling, like hey, your top ten points list. Um, maybe a couple sponsors exemptions are in these elite tour series events, and that's how you satisfy the golf market as far as the fan that wants to see the best players playing week in week out if the live tour is going to still exist right and and then i think you know if you do that then it's a lot easier than to i think i think you end up retaining a lot more sponsors to your point you know in that structure where it's like hey you know like a, i don't know the nature of, of wells fargo circumstances or, or what hondas were before they left but it's like we know you're, you know, Wells Fargo was sort of an elevated event, so they were getting good fields. But Honda, it's like we know that you're not getting what you maybe expected or wanted in terms of field strength. So we're going to make a smaller ask of you. You're still going to get a lot of really good players. And by the way, you're going to get a lot of rising stars. And, yeah. and they could be the next tour. And, and, and so I just think it becomes palatable in a lot of different ways. So I, I think, to me, we, it makes a ton of sense. I'd be shocked if that's not already being discussed, you know? we That's why, like, 2025, they need to blow up this system to be looking more this way. And – and the networks, like you mentioned it, like the media rights deal is not representative of what we're getting right now. It's it's a watered right. down product in different in and especially the the open events. It's just not the same fields that we're accustomed to seeing. And listen, we we love calling the events where we see somebody change like their lives change. And that's what the most fun part about golf and, and TV is that you don't have to have a a a star win an event you can have somebody that that wins the honda classic or whatever event it is that their lives change and to me the problem is is that it's just the way it's set up right now it's it's just difficult for the networks to invest or the the golf fan to invest um, or the sponsors to invest in a field that they just don't know what they're gonna get and I think it's very difficult to sell um, when you look at the field list at, at some of the watered down events. And you're just thinking like, man, is this the best we have for for golf right now? And they've got to find a way to get the best players playing together and then also create a competitive competitive B product, a relegation type of promotion product to where you can get players funneling in and out. And then you have. Like this week, though, the Sony field was where I was like, man, they have got to figure this out. You can't have yeah. guys that their lives change and they get their card. And and I'm not sitting here complaining for those players because they have an incredible opportunity in front of them. Um, but shouldn't they have a place to play once they get their PGA Tour card or, or their card, whatever it is? Well, and if, and if it's a more realistic set of expectations coming in, it's probably more palatable. If it's like, hey, you graduated to the regular PGA Tour, like you don't just get to jump right to this elite tour yet. So it's not like, oh, I got my tour card. Here I go. And it's like, uh, yeah, you got to You got to fly to Honolulu for a meeting yeah. uh, for a tournament <laughs> that you're not in. But you can try to Monday qualify. And it's like I, I can totally see how that would be a, uh, a, a, a tough reality for those guys that are that are on tour. Um I you know and one and one I, one quick thing, Charlie. Can I can you can you uh, chime in on this real quick? Do you think you'd have to separate the FedEx Cup points from like one to the other? Because right now, every the big issue, as you call it, with with the lifeblood of the PGA Tour, the players that are not at the top, is how how and we we discussed this the the distribution of the new FedEx Cup point structure is heavily heavily favored towards the guys that are in the signature events that really make it difficult for the players that are in the open field events to have a chance to get in the signature events. Do you think in this new format that it would have to like, you would have a FedEx cup points for the elite FedEx cup. Like there would no, there wouldn't all be in the same pond again. 100%. I, that, that was where I was going to go with this. And I think you're dead on. It, it's just, it's just too hard because then it it's, you know, in some ways it's like the college football playoff where it's like, well, you know, Florida state went undefeated, but, uh, a bunch of a bunch of people sitting in a room who don't play football think that because you know their quarterback was injured, they're not going to win a game. And and they might very well. I mean, I mean, shoot. I mean, a bunch of guys opted out, but they got steamrolled by Georgia. So that may very well have been the case. But people are deciding that isn't the actual thing that we're here to watch and see played. And I think in some senses that's kind of what's happened with the FedEx Cup, where it's like this is now worth seven hundred points, and that one's still worth. 500 points and it's and it, it's just all feels 
arbitrary to a certain extent where, where you it's like how are you how are you assigning value to this win in yeah. sort of a lab instead yeah. of like what the, what was actually done so that's all by way of saying is like I, I really what I do really love about you know I, I think the next 10 swing five thing is really cool and I want to see it play out this year and so if it's more of a there, there is a self-contained point structure for that level of the tour and then if you finish in a certain place you, you could have whatever points you want it could be a 50,000 points per win. We don't care. Like just however you determine the top five or 10 on that tour is then those players go get to play in the elite, you know, event on a rolling basis. That seems to make a lot more sense to me rather than saying, we're going to try to kind of mix all these different points in and make them all work yeah, in the system yeah. and figure it out. You know, I, I like, I like our plan better. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe Jay and company will hear our thoughts and, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they already listened to the show, you know. <laughs> if so, Jay, thanks for listening. Please yeah, join Jay, us. When, at your Jay, uh, make, sure, <laughs> make sure you like and subscribe and make sure you send it to five <laughs> friends. <laughs> sure, Jay will get right on that. Um, to, to, to briefly, we have a few more things to hit on here, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad we went in depth on this, but just a few more from the century. Kind of fired me up. I just got yeah, fired up. I love up. it. I feel, like, I feel like we're on to something. I feel like we finally figured it out because – how like where are you going to start the live guys? You know that. Like, how are you going to get the live guys back over here? And, and to me, it, it seems obvious now. Like you have a. Well, well so it's it's sorry. I, I react because you you reminded me of something that I see. We're we're fired up this week. Yeah, this. but you reminded me of something that that I thought that I also think is is a key important part of this and, and talking about the the live guys and and just the different forms of competition too, which is to say that. If you make the elite competition smaller, you know, kind of what where, where Liv started, like you only have to play X amount of times per year. So let's say it's 15 events total or even less. What you leave more room for is non-traditional golf or even non-green grass golf. So things like team competitions, the extent yes, that guys want to play yes, in those. Yeah. Things like TGL. Because and and again, this is not this is not like the pile on Chris Kirk hour, but like, you know who sells more Callaway golf clubs than Chris Kirk? The good, good, good guys. I mean, they're literally, I mean, like, there's not, there's not a Chris Kirk branded golf club. Those, so I say all that by way of saying it's like if you get people, you know, really excited. If you get someone who doesn't necessarily watch professional golf but has come to the game of late and they're and they're coming to this thing and they're like trying to make sense of the system and the way it's changing and it's like it, it's not very approachable as a new fan trying to understand it and figure out how you're going to root for it and follow it. But if you make it very simple for people. You care about these four majors, and then here are these additional eight to ten events past those four majors that are our biggest marquee events that you have to follow every single year. And then past that, we're going to you know, give you a bunch of different types of programming, some of it produced by us, some of it produced by people who are adjacent to the tour. That, to me, feels like a, a better serving to grow yeah. the game, as we keep talking about, than – where it's going to give you a million tour events and, and you can't figure out which ones are important or not and who's good and who isn't. So that's a little bit of a diversion from, I think where you're going with live, but I just think that's an important thing to say of like, let's really think about creative ways to grow the game. And let's say there's 80 players that get to play in the elite tour series, 70 off the PGA tour um, cup that they have every year. And let's say the live tour players, yeah, I would care more about the live golf tour. If the top 10, of that tour and their points list got into the elite series. Like I would generally follow it more. I would care who 100%. got in. I would be frustrated on players that obviously had breakout years that probably didn't deserve to be on the tour in the first place. Like maybe you have an issue with that, but um, you definitely, you definitely want to guarantee some sponsors invites from live and that, like making sure that John Rom, Cameron Smith, Bryson DeChambeau, like those types of players are going to be at those events to you can, and now it like, you could take that piece to networks and be like, Hey, like we, we got the guys, like we're going to have a team concept integrated throughout the year with it easier to follow. maybe a little difficult, difficult to cover with the team stuff. I don't, I haven't really been able to figure out how difficult it's been for um, the CW network to, to, to cover the team and the individual stuff, like how, com how complicated that could be. But yeah. And, and, and we talked about this too last week, what happens to the players that sign with live that are already off? You know, where do they go right now? They go to the Asian tour. Do you want them now to start at the corn Ferry tour level? Or do you want it, some of the guys that had a certain status to start at the B level tour that we kind of just discussed where um, they can work their way into it from there? I don't, I don't know what's fair, but 
I, I wouldn't have an issue with a, a player that won multiple times to start in the middle middle tour. Um, but if yeah. they started at the top, maybe you'd have some you'd have some dudes have have a big problem. Maybe I don't know what the who would be the players that would be guaranteed into that elite tour tour series. But I guarantee you, it's it's a pretty dang small list. Yeah, I I think that's completely fair. I mean, I think I think some of it is to your point, sponsor exemptions to make sure we get the guys in who we need to get in. I mean, if you look at like, like you know, I don't know how you how, how you do this. The... <laughs> You're not sending <laughs> yeah, Phil right. to the middle ground tour, right? Right, right. Like, exactly. He's just he's a name. He's he's eyeballs, and you need eyeballs. You give him some sort of career accomplishment sort of deal there, but I, I think it's like if you look at okay, so if. 50 of the 125 on the PGA tour get into these signature events. And that's 40%. Like, I don't know that you can let 20 live guys into these signature things, but maybe it's like kind of to your point, 10 or, yeah. or, or, or a quarter of it, 12, you know, and then plus like two or three sponsor invites. And then you're kind of getting closer to that. Something that looks equivalent to the, to the tour process. So it's like, Hey, mm-hmm. this is, this is fair. Like this is, this is roughly equivalent. And, and then it wor- it works itself out over time as people start playing these things and you're accruing points or either staying or you're getting bumped out for the next yeah. wave of guys to come through. And and, yeah. and I think, you know, it, it's it I think the point initially is that it's going to be really hard to figure it out out of the gate because of all the, you know, how do you mesh everything properly? But you know, play solves everything over time, right? It's like the best the, except, the best player is going to rise except to the top. if you're Taylor Gage. It does not solve everything. <laughs> you could win the Live Golf Tour points merit, and it doesn't solve everything. All it solves is your bank account right now. <laughs> That's that is fair. It's it might solve something under our new system, but uh, no, this yeah. is I'm I'm glad we, way, I'm glad. That's a way how you you know not like the way Taylor played. Like you you would be totally yeah. fine with him getting into the lead tour 100%. series because of his play. Like he earned playing very well against quality competition. Now he's in the elite tour series and we'll see how good he actually is. And we already know, already know it. he's very good, uh, but let's, let's see how he does against everybody else. <laughs> well, well, let's just let you, I mean, while we're on this, like I'm just going to look at last year's points list and, and just kind of just quickly run through it. It's like Taylor Gooch in Cam Smith in Brooks Kepka in Bryson in Dustin Johnson in there's five there. Patrick Reed in Harold Varner in Mito Pereira in. Like Brandon Grace is like where I'm starting kind of like that. He's ninth in the list. I'm like oh, Harold Varner was in. he finished seventh last year. He did. There, he did. I didn't realize he played that in well the, in the in the, t- in the player point standing. So like Brandon Grace, then Charles Howell the third, then um, then uh, uh, Sebastian Munoz. What's, why don't we just uh, cut it, it off at eight guys and then we just pick four <laughs> spots then? <laughs> well, in that because then you pass that you have guys like Honorbon Lahiri, Carlos Ortiz, Sergio Garcia. You know, it's like you know Joaquin Neiman was 21st. It's like you know. You get a little further down, you're like, you maybe need some exemptions there. But, like, I think that 10 feels about right. Uh, 10 feels about right. And and then, you know, you kind of go from there. But also, like, you're adding John Rahm this year. And if he gets another marquee name and you're starting to bump down, and then all of a sudden that top 10 looks pretty quality. All guys that I'm like, yes, no problem with seeing any of those guys in on the Elite Tour. Um, so, okay. Yeah, look, we solved. Look, you know, this we is, have this solved a little uh, workshop we've done here. Uh, I, you know, you got to discuss <laughs> it when you feel inspired by it. And today was that day, so well, uh, worth definitely worth the deep dive there on on our uh, continued restructuring of the tour, uh, which Jay Monahan will of course be on top of as soon as he uh, gives us five stars and subscribes and shares with a friend. <laughs> uh, a couple couple ones I just want to touch on quickly from Century. Uh, the Scotty Scheffler flat stick discussion has revived itself for 2024. Once again, um, you know, looking at his strokes gain stats at the century was third in the field off the tee, second in the field in approach and 45th in putting where he, he, he uh, lost uh, almost two and three quarter strokes to the field. Um, you know, one that is, look, I don't know if there's much more to say about this other than our same line we used last year. Where it's like, it's just, it's the same old deal, but you know, it was kind of interesting to see him go to a new putter go to a new super stroke grip, work with Bill Kenyon this off season, have three really solid putting rounds of the hero, have a bad one to finish the tournament, but still win the tournament. So it didn't really matter and wonder how it was going to look this year. Um, and this is our first time out. So a, a T five, you know, Scotty is doing Scotty things as, as always, but just wanted to put a little pin in and, and see how that goes going forward. Well, just real quick on that. Like yeah. the first two days he was, he was in the top half of the field in putting. It was just, third and fourth round he just didn't putt well and i'm still buying stock in his putter that's 
That's all I'm going to say. I love it. Uh, another one that I'd like to get to because I'd like for everyone to congratulate me on in our segment uh, last week talking about rising stars to keep an eye on. I mentioned uh, Sahith Thagala. And here we look, – look at this. Week one, coming out of the gates hot. So, uh, everyone, you're welcome. You're welcome. I, I'll, I'll take my plaudits. I'll take my roses here now. Uh, you, you, you walked with him uh, were you with Sunday or was it another day as well? Uh, I think it was with the Saturday and Sunday, uh, at, at different periods of times. It's kind of bounced around a little bit. Uh, but yeah, his, what do we think? He, he's a very creative player and he hit some unreal shots from, from areas that, that I was just like, Oh man, like he was in a divot short of the green right on 15 and I thought it was going to be like a chop down low shot. And he's like, yeah, I'm just going to play it up in the air. And, and he just hits this like flop shot from a divot. I'm just like, what the, like, who does that? <laughs> and he hit it to like four feet. So I, I just, he's a player that played well at Augusta last year. And maybe he's a guy that like, that's a, when I'm thinking about yeah. the masters this year, he's just like a, a dark horse guy that I think could be a, a, a real threat to winning that, that tournament, even though he, He's only played it once. He's just got a ton of uh, creativity to his game. He's got a lot of talent, hits it plenty far enough, good putter. So, yeah, I, I really I really like him as a person, and he's definitely a, uh, a very, uh, very good player. And, and congratulations to you, but it didn't matter because Min-Woo, Minwoo didn't even play. So we can't yes. compare head-to-heads on, <laughs> on our dudes now. This this was not a head-to-head because, I mean, listen, I also mentioned uh, our, our other friend of the pod, Ludwig Bear, who uh, – big bounce back from Ludwig on Sunday. Uh, we won't even we won't even. What did he shoot, like – he shot, like, uh, four over and then 10 under or something like that on Saturday, Sunday? He sh- uh, Yes, that's correct. He <laughs> shot 77 on Saturday, and then he shot uh, 63 on Sunday, I believe. So that, nice all that matters is – It's kind of nice to know that I could have beaten Ludwig on Saturday. You know, <laughs> if, if I would have a teed off one-on-one and with him – it, and this is without SK even practicing. I, I think I get it done, Charlie. I do. I do. Listen, it was it was a it was a bit of a tough week for Versa One Gang. I'll say, Versa One's loving the Bermuda Greens down here in in uh, Palm Beach, Florida. It's looking really the eye test passing the eye test right love now. It, love um, it. Well, a, a quick one here because this is a little tease for you. You might see this guy pop up on our podcast in the near future. But as we're talking about. Um, you know, you getting out there playing, playing well, along with Kevin Kisner. Just any brief thoughts you want to offer about working with Kiz this week on the broadcast? Maybe we'll unpack those in an upcoming episode of the, of the pod. <laughs> Listen, I've always loved Kiz, and uh, it was really fun to work with him. You know, I think, uh, you know, it, it takes a while to really understand all the ins and outs of TV. And, and he sat in the truck on Thursday. And our truck is just chaotic. There's just a lot going on. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe all the things that have to happen to see what you see on the TV and just the, the organization it takes to knowing where you're going, this and that. Like it, it's, it's very, very complicated and stressful. And kids was in there for an hour and just was like, oh my God, like I can't do this. And there's just a hundred people talking, yelling and uh and so he finally gets into our booth and and he's like oh so i only just hear you guys okay i can do this <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, was, I, I thought his storytelling was great i thought he knew yeah. you know he obviously has great relationships with the players uh, i loved going back and forth with him on stuff and, um as well you know he's uh self-deprecating which which i like is well you know i think that that humanizes any player that's made 30 million dollars you know he at times um you know talks about his career and, and, and the things that he's done, but also can laugh, laugh about his distances um, uh, and other things too, just about his relationships with players. So I thought he did a great job and looking forward to working with him in Phoenix. My, my wife uh, said to me at one point, she was like, I think, um, I think Smiley's in the booth this week, but he looks like a little bit different. And I said, listen, Amanda, as someone who graduated from a Southern university and, and parts my hair to the side, your stereotyping of us is, is very, very hurtful. And, uh, I, I, I do not stand for it. Stereotyping <laughs> or the Southern swoop. I mean, can, can you believe it? I, I, I did get a great kick out of that. I'm like, no, it's, you know, kids is they're, they're cut from similar cloths, uh, you know, but, we, but it's, we definitely look alike from like a 30 foot view for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Like, but if you saw us in person, you know, I'm, I'm six one six two. He's a little shorter, but also just like just profile of the face and and hair definitely 
Yeah. Uh, definitely a little similar. It's my doppelganger. Is that the correct word? I think he's that... a doppelganger. I, I think I think the kids on the internet would say something like, you know, mom, can we have Smiley Kaufman? And it's she says, no, we have Smiley Kaufman at home, and it's and it's Kevin Kisner. And uh... <laughs> Francie thinks I kind of look like Carlos Ortiz sometimes too, so it's kind of funny. I got oh, like two go. different golfers on tour that kind of I resemble. Carlos Ortiz, another side partner. Uh, there are, you know, dozens of us out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's, that's a wrap of sorts on century. Uh, I can't believe it's taken us this long to get to maybe the, the biggest piece of news, at least in the, the greater golf culture interest, but it's official Been rumored for, for weeks now, uh, tiger gave some very short answers about this, um, at the PNC championship, but tiger has parted ways with Nike after, I mean, golly, outside of probably Michael Jordan, I'd say more so than LeBron James. I don't think anybody, ha- any athlete has has been more um, associated with the Nike brand than Tiger Woods. So the statement he posted uh, earlier today was, over 27 years ago, I was fortunate to start a partnership with one of the most iconic brands in the world. The days since have been filled with so many amazing moments and memories. If I started naming them, I could go on forever. Phil Knight's passion and vision brought this Nike and Nike Golf partnership together, and I want to personally thank him along with, with the Nike employees and incredible athletes I've had the pleasure of working with along the way. People will ask if there is another chapter. Yes, there will certainly be another chapter. See you in LA. So with that said, Smiley, you know, what are your, what are your predictions as to what we see Tiger in at the Genesis? Your, your team, uh, team Polo Ralph Lauren, RLX here. You want to make a, a pitch, a quick pitch for, for uh, RLX? Well, if, if if they sign Tiger, I think I'll probably be moving on to another company because the because uh, <laughs> they're going they're going to go all in. I think any company that goes in for Tiger is probably going to be cutting the whole roster. <laughs> yeah, but fair. You know, I don't know because I, well, I think what I'm most interested to see is his uh, his TW brand. Does Nike own that, or does does Tiger Woods own that? And that that to me. Does it does it change what we're gonna see? No, but it's kind of what you saw with Phil Mickelson um, in his last, you know, eight years or so. Went to his famous jump uh, at, mm-hmm. at Augusta National. So I kind of think that's what we're gonna see is, is is if Tiger Woods owns that brand, which I assume he probably does. I, I didn't know if Nike had any. I, I can't imagine that Nike owns the uh, the brand logo of Tiger Woods, but. Mm-hmm. And and let's say they don't. I, I assume that's what we're gonna see for Tiger in the future is is his brand logo on a shirt. I don't know what the shirt's gonna be. Um, I assume he's probably gonna do a deal with somebody, but dude, there's no there's not any like there's not money in clothes. There really isn't. Unless you're just gonna go you just give Tiger half the company because that's that's the only way you can pay Tiger Woods unless you're I, outside of Nike, who who else is going to be paying him that? Unless it's an overseas brand that just has all this money. Well, I mean, so obviously, the, and I think we even discussed this on the show, is that the rumors are surrounding TaylorMade because he's, of course, you know, he has a club deal with TaylorMade, and there have been postings they, of late. Do they have clothes? When, that's it- that. That's the <laughs> sort of the rumor is that that they are launching. Uh, a a clothing uh, oh, okay. line or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Like, and, right. and this has been there's been like job post things of like you know we're looking for a, you know I don't know what the the specific you know title of the posting is, but just someone to run an online e commerce wing of TaylorMade that's that's apparel related. So, you know that's one sort of of guess as to where he could end up. But again, I mean, it'd require a lot of money. Are I thought like TaylorMade and Adidas had like a partnership? No. I think they did at one point. Remember, there are a but lot of guys. I feel like Sergio was a was a was a maybe a long time ago, or, or maybe it was Dustin Johnson way back in the day. That yeah. was a Taylor made and Adidas Berger guy. Was Adidas uh, Xander Schauffele Adidas? I, I, but I he was Calway. He was Calway. So that that because Ludwig's now titleist. So, yeah, I, 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 I think that what happened there. there was I think Adidas owned some sort of controlling stake in TaylorMade and then decided to spin it off when it wasn't as profitable as maybe they wanted it to be. And and I, and I think that's pr- probably where Nike's sitting right now is like, you know, for all the popularity in golf, maybe like they just make so much more money doing other things that Nike does that it, it doesn't really make sense for them. Um, so the, the TaylorMade clothing one's an interesting one to me, especially when you look at their roster of guys because okay, so Jason Day just left for Malbon, which by the way, that's a whole other topic we didn't get to. The pants he was wearing this week. I mean, 
good lord like i thought we were like fashion is great but we're going backwards there not sure what's happening um uh, i think but, those but, pants like the pants i saw him wear if we we talk about lucas glover's pants in memphis <laughs> those pants are not surviving in memphis i'm telling you they're not making it well it's like i, I just want to go up as weird as it sounds and just grab his pants and just see what material they're made out of. Stop. <laughs> because, because... Bonk, Charlie. Bonk. <laughs> <laughs> because, but here, here's what I mean by that. Is if they're like performance material, okay. I, you know, talk to me. Like, from I'll, what I'll have a conversation from what I could you. see, uh, no. They look like I mean, painter's pants or something. Or like, they look pretty, that, that they look pretty thick, man. <laughs> it's what, uh, it's when it. you go... When you go paintball and, you know, like you wear those pants, <laughs> yes, it like doesn't yes. hurt. Like that's what it looked like from from my view. But fashionable, like different, yes. Um, w- worthy to wear in Memphis, I don't I don't think so. So so Jason Day, of course, leaves that roster. And and I'm not I forget what is what is club. Uh, I, I guess he, he does play TaylorMade Irons. And so maybe a TaylorMade staff guy. But, you know, Bridgestone Ball, maybe not all in on TaylorMade. But if you look at the at the. The rest of the Nike guys, or at least the notable ones, Rory McIlroy, TaylorMade guy, Scotty Scheffler, TaylorMade guy, Tommy Fleetwood, TaylorMade guy. Like if, I mean, even shooting this last year, Nelly Corda, who who did a, a a Nike deal and then a TaylorMade deal, and so it it feels like if Nike is indeed ma- trying to get out of the golf apparel space that it would make a ton of sense for TaylorMade to just fill that void as, as sort of an active wear type of, you know, golf clothing yeah, they maker. Just get, they probably just get paid a little bit more um, to, yeah, like on these on these club deals, just like, hey, we, we're going to pay you this much more to wear, wear the clothes as well. I, I just, my only request is I want the old TaylorMade logo. I want to bring <laughs> that back for the apparel, and I want burner, whatever you call Rocket that, dolls. that rust. I, I rocket, rocket balls. balls. We get rocket balls green. We get like burner rust, whatever that bronze color is. I, I want that in in the the color of pellet for for all the clothing. That those are my advice. <laughs> um, I also like. I, I was having a bit of fun with this on my own today. Like a couple of pitches for for Tiger. Like how hilarious would it be if we saw him show up at the Genesis with like a G four hat that said like TGR and comically large script and like a, a blood red glove uh that that was that was my one or like what if he was like um you know he, he's big call of duty guy what about like a pxg black ops full black outfit with like a call of duty shirt sponsor on, on that's the his chest vibe, i feel like i think like that's kind of his thing um, I, i'm just saying or you know or like kind of how he shows up to the golf course in cutoffs you know like i think a cutoff <laughs> yes. would be a great way to just be like yo i'm yoked like what are you gonna yes. do about it? You know, can you like imagine a, him setting up in, in Memphis yes. in the summer <laughs> with his triceps literally on the on the uh, on the T marker? Like his arms are that big, just like. <laughs> I don't know if there are any. I don't know if there are any rules against that, but like if, if you're wearing a skin tight, you know, long sleeve thing or even short sleeve thing, and then you wear just cut off again, sleeves. again, Charlie Bonk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bonk my let's move. out of the segment. <laughs> let's, let's move out of the clothing. Bonking segment our here. way out of the clothing segment. <laughs> we got we got uh, Charlie saying, "I just want to feel Jason Day's pants," and now we got Charlie saying, "Skin tight Tiger Woods <laughs> shirt." <laughs> I'm just I'm making I'm making some provocative pitches. I, I'm here. I'm trying to grow the game. I'm just trying to grow the game, guys. Just let me let me grow the game in peace <laughs> um all right we're, oh, we're, man. we're bonking that segment away um not not much more here other than uh, a, a a nice positive uplifting one to go out with which is gary woodland making his return from brain surgery this week at sony open this is awesome i love this yeah i'm excited uh sony opens a, a fun week uh it's an easy golf course to walk so i'm excited about that uh, I'm sure we're going to see some of the highlights of Jordan and I in a kayak at some point. Our our producer for the week's already said he's going to do something with that. Oh, kids that. will be on. Kids will be playing. Um, I'm hoping that he'll be in a feature group so I can watch kids play because that'll be fun. Just to play to the TV side of it. And hopefully, we do like a walk and talk or something. But uh, we're going to hopefully have him uh, on the podcast this week as well. So look forward to uh, interview interview with kids and about his week and what's ahead for him. So. Um, guy, that to look forward to in your feed this week. 
That's perfect. That's a great way to take us out. That that should be the next thing that you are looking for, a fun little conversation between Smiley and Kiz, just recapping his, his first week in the booth. Looking forward to that. And then, of course, on the other side of that, some Sony Open recap as we start getting into the 2024 PGA Tour season. So we appreciate you watching and listening, and we will talk to you back here soon. I've actually watched a couple of episodes of, of, of y'all earlier, and uh, you guys have some good takes. So thanks for uh, thanks for what you guys do. It's cool to see what you guys are doing, and uh, I, I know golf fans appreciate it, but we we do too. So please keep it up. I think you're doing a tremendous job, and and you know I listen to this podcast; it's really cool. And.